following is presented by CrewRoundTable.com Podcast Network. Welcome to Crew Roundtable Bites. Food for your mind. Recorded live to tape. No edits. Real, raw, and reasonable. This is Crew Roundtable Bites. Welcome back, friends, to episode four of Crew Roundtable Bites, the summer hiatus show for CrewRoundtable.com. We're here to keep you in the know with fresh content discussing all topics under the sun, helping you make up your own mind with a point of view that maybe you wouldn't hear before. There are two of us here. My name is Gino, and I'm joined by... JR, as always. And we are here giving you, as I said, the Crew Roundtable Bites. Please visit us on the web at crewroundtable.com, where you can subscribe to get all of the shows as that are part of the Crew Roundtable podcast network. On this show, we are going to be discussing death education. Why are we not teaching children about death? Now, the impetus for this show came about when uh, we were, well, we were looking for information or topics to uh, discuss on our main show, Crew Roundtable. I found this, and this is pretty, it's an incredible stat um, where it states that in Canada, approximately 10 to 15 percent of students in Canadian classrooms are grieving a loss or anticipating the death of someone close to them. We have sex education in high school. Why do we not have death education? And keep in mind, we're not just talking about death, but we're talking about the entire process around it. We're talking about the process of dying, loss, and caregiving through palliative care. I'm going to throw it over to JR. JR, take us away. Take us into this topic. Uh, I like to I, I just start like to make reference uh, an author, uh, Caitlin Doty. She is a U.S.-based mortician. She had a very popular YouTube channel called Ask a Mortician, where people, uh, where she answered questions she was emailed about the death process, uh, the embalming process, prepping them, the whole everything about the funeral rites and stuff like that. Uh, so I would I would definitely encourage you to see that read the book. It's called Smoke Gets in Your Eyes and Other Lessons from the Crematory, and it talks about death process because she used to be a mortician, so she would. Not, not only embalm the body and prep the body physically, but, you know, deal with the, the family and be able to and comfort them and try, try they, they basically try to handle the funeral for you and get everything out of your way so you can, you can start or you can start the grieving process. Uh, and and the, the book talks about just this process, the, the, the fact that we've gotten, death, death for us has now become a rarity and is almost... I would almost is almost exclusively you know for the most part it's depending on what aspect of the of the population the majority of deaths come from old age you know um, and we uh, it, it, which is different from how things used to be two maybe three hundred years ago where death was very commonplace you know people died infant mortality was very high disease was very common. Um, the, uh, you know, the average age, uh, the, uh, and this is something I was explaining with, discussing with Gino earlier, average age and life expectancy are two different things. The average age is simply a mathematical average of everyone who died. Uh, you know, two, three hundred years ago, you know, infant it was, there was a good percentage that you would, you would die as a child before your first birthday. You know, the, the, there was, there was high, a high rate that, a child was going to catch some disease and die, and there. But once surviving the first few years, there was a barring any accident, there was a good chance that you'd end up surviving to, you know, seventy or eighty. So you average those two extremes, and you end up with an average age of 35, 30, 35, 40. That's the reason why, even in the developed countries in the West, the first birthday is still like the, you know, the whiz bang. All, it's revered. Everyone goes out birthday because you still have that idea in our collective memory of if you they needed to make it to that first year. Now it's more if you can be born 
we have very low infant mortality rates. So now it's just the hurdle is being born. Yes, and, right? and even and, and for women, surviving childbirth uh, used to be uh, used to be very questionable. Uh, my my grandmother's mother uh, passed away uh, shortly after giving birth to, to her third child. She and, bled to death post post birth. And your uh, your estimate before of two to three hundred years ago, I, I think that's much too generous. Um, my maternal grandmother had nine children that lived. She had two that never made it out of childhood, right? And that's mm-hmm. that's not going too far back. I mean, I'm I'm two generations removed from living on a farm in the hillside with no running water and power, right? Like it, we don't have to go back 200, 200 years. There's still places now on the globe that have incredibly high infant mortality rates, right? Mm-hmm. For you know a litany of reasons we're not going to get into, but we don't have to go that far back. And just from my own personal experience, I know my wife and my first child, a hundred years ago, they'd both be dead if it wasn't for some of the advances that we've got in modern medicine and, and, and the pleasure and privilege of living in a country like Canada, right? Mm-hmm. We don't have to go that far back. And I agree with you 100% that most people experience death at a later age and they simply just don't know how to deal with it. I agree with that. I almost feel it makes us a little lazy and we start taking things for granted. You know, grandparents, you know, they die at 70, 80, 90 years old. You start, especially for little children, you start getting it in their head that grandpa will always be around. And and, and they, they it's never discussed that one day they may pass away. You don't want it. We seem to want to shield children that, you know, something might might happen to them. You know, enjoy your time now. You know, the 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 grandparents almost get treated like an unlimited resource. They're just they, always going to be there. They're always going to be there, and I don't have to worry about it. And you know, my life, I, I never have to worry for the eventuality that grandma or grandpa are going to die. And then when they do die, because that's the natural order of things that you you know you're, you're supposed you, you're supposed to bury your parents. Um, nobody's ready for it. And I know people who have to make a point, especially now that we have social media, uh, you know, six, seven, eight years after the fact, they're still mourning the anniversary publicly, it, almost to a ridiculous amount. It's like, it's like I, don't, I, I, know, I don't mean to tell someone how to grieve, but I think I know how, I, I think I can tell, how, so I don't, can't tell someone how long they have to grieve. But I think I can. I think I can make an expectation of how publicly you, you can you can keep grieving. Well, it isn't also the length of grieving. Isn't that part of this education process? Because yes, there is a grief. There, there is a grief process, but you can't be stuck in an in an eternal spiral of grieving someone who passed on. Cor- correct. Correct. You need you need to be able to to move on. You can't. You can't suddenly become non-functional because someone has passed away. I mean, especially if it was, especially if this was a per, an older person who who you weren't dependent on. If you if you're someone younger and and, and they were more integrated into your life, it's it's, it's different. Or like a spouse who you're not expecting to who passed away at a time you weren't expecting them to. But like a parent who dies of of old age natural causes should be grieved. With the appropriate amount, with the appropriate uh, uh, perce- uh, appropriate amount of uh, grief, and we just don't know how to do that anymore. Death has really been at the back of our mind. We go to a funeral every once in a while, and and that's it. But nobody really wants to think about what happens, and even to the point where even pet, children are even shielded from pet deaths. You know how I'm sure we've all heard the adage about the dog that went to the farm. You know, meanwhile it actually passed away, but they they can't tell the the, the child that we we we, get, we brought him to a farm. Or so I I might be a terrible parent then, <laughs> because I remember on Sesame Street when Mr. Hooper died. Oh yeah, that was a big one, right? And. They did not shy away from it. So Sesame Street is, you know, you're you're looking at they're they're 
what would you say? Kids that watch that show are what, four to ten, roughly? Probably. Even, yeah. In that there age. are a variety of ages. Right, but you know, we don't have infants watching Sesame Street, and we don't really have adolescents watching Sesame Street, right? True. And let's not forget, uh, Big Bird on that show is perpetually eight years old. Perpetually eight years old, correct. They did not shy away from Mr. Hooper's death. They didn't just replace him with a new... Mr. Hooper. He didn't move away. He didn't move away. They were told he <clears throat> died. And that was a big decision. That was huge. They, they waited two or three weeks making that decision. It, it, it's almost a case study on how, uh, how much work they had to do. Because Sesame Street has a lot of child psychologists on staff. They do a lot of child study groups. Um, just, just not to diverge too far, but as one example. Um, the reason kids... The reason they decided to make there was a long running joke in in in, um, in Sesame Street where Big Bird's best friend, the Snuffleupagus, who was an elephant, a brown mammoth like uh, character, would never be seen by the by the grown ups. The, the 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 kids would see him, Big Bird would see him, but he would always walk away or be shielded or be blocked from view every time a, a grown up showed up. Really? I don't remember that at all. That was No, I remember that. I do remember really? that. Yeah. It was a running joke that, oh, I just missed him. Oh, okay. But what they do is they tend to interview the kids after they see it. And they started getting a particular uh, message that, oh, well, what do you get, what do you get from the, from, what do you get from this skit? And they were getting a lot of, well, it sounds like parents don't believe you even when you're telling the truth just because they didn't see the truth themselves. That was the takeaway of Snuffleupagus? Yes. That's what kids were getting from that. It, 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 kids get a completely different. They, they, that's why they had to run all the skits by kids. Because what... That is what, an what, incredibly deep commentary on Snuffleupagus not being seen by adults. Yeah. That is... Wow. Wow. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So that's just the kind of thing they would do. So, so Mr. Hooper's uh, death, and that's why they eventually ended up making the par- the parents introduce the snuff, and he wasn't. They stopped that joke because clearly the, the the kids weren't getting the joke. The humor is being missed on the kids, and the kids were seeing something a little more serious. And that's why they, that's why they ended up revealing Snuffleupagus to the to the grown ups. Incredible. Uh, now, with that, with that being said, um, the death education that that both of us would support involves more than just you know the biological process of dying. You'd be surprised how many people don't know what palliative care is. Um, you would be surprised how many people don't know even the financial aspects of someone dying. I mean, that, that leads into a whole other discussion of financial literacy, which is not taught in schools, but that's a different, that's a different show. Well, then, there's, then, then, then another thing they try to do is, is prepaying for your, your funeral. Who's, who's they? Um, the funeral home tends, tends to, has been kind of pushing this just as a, as a way to do some pre-sales. But in retrospect, it makes a lot of sense. It's basically... Uh, instead of waiting for you to die and then they have to, then expecting your loved ones to make funeral arrangements and, and, and down to um, how long do you want to view them for? Where's the funeral plot? What, what kind of headstone do you want? You know, all the nitty gritty. To make those decisions at a time when you try, when you're still trying to recover from the death of a loved one, is challenging. Now we now Gino and I are Italian, so the death the death process, the funeral process for us is a more elongated process. Oh, it takes place while they're still alive. Well, <laughs> no, the, from what, well, going, it's it's like it's like a point of pride. Whereas saying, um, I went and I bought my plot. For example, you know the, I mean? in, in the Jew, in the Jewish and Islamic faiths, you know they, those those religions were were founded at a time in in in, in a very hot climate. In, uh, in a time where a dead body lying around in very hot conditions meant de- disease was coming very quickly. You know, you couldn't, uh, you can't have, you could not have a body just lying around because th- that, that was, that was going to cause problems for the entire village. So death rituals in, in Jewish and Islamic faiths are very quick. 
person has the person is buried within 24 hours there's no embalming there's no fancy schmancy uh, 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 coffins there's no like extra reinforced with headlights and anodized metal they're in a box they're wrapped up and they're buried right away just just as a matter of practicality it's yeah it, it started as a practicality and hasn't changed in, in, in the two or three thousand years since it was established. Uh, whereas the Catholic faith is, is slightly uh, slightly different, uh, it's been modernized through its exposure with Europe, and uh, it, it usually takes place over two to three days. The body's usually embalmed. Uh, that's the, most most uh, Christian faiths that they embalm the body, they keep them refrigerated. They're shown two or th- they, they, you know there's they're shown two or three days to for people to come in and make their make their peace, and then there's a funeral. And uh, and um, uh, the the next big movement is is to not not only just plan your mu- plan your funeral, but to pay for it in advance, because funerals are fairly expensive. You know, co- coffins themselves can go for five or six thousand uh, dollars. I think funeral in general costs uh, anywhere between fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. So you you know, the, and then on the top of the hardship of having to do that planning, it's. Um, it's it, it, it's something people aren't equipped to deal with because uh, the discussion doesn't take place. Parents either don't want to talk about it, or the parent or the or the or the kids don't want to hear after don't want to hear about their parents talking about death. You know, uh, there's many scenarios where the where parents repeatedly try to have this conversation with their kid, and the kids are like, "Oh, I just I just can't." picture I just can't think of you you dying and not being here I don't want to talk about it and and then and then, and then when it's then the, the whole funeral is in disarray because plans didn't get transferred over plans plans were not discussed there there is a there is a practical component to planning a funeral um, there are medical components so you have people who might have living wills uh, you have the psychological component of the people who are still living after, which we've already touched on a couple of them. You know, how how long should you be grieving someone? Um, I mean, it might sound like a totally ridiculous question, but the example you brought up at the beginning, you know, it depends on the closeness that you had to the person. It depends on how big a factor they were in your, in your life. Um, there are people who will grieve, sometimes grieve their pets more than they grieve people. Right. Yeah. Like there is there is not a monopoly on death education for just the death of people, right? Um, which is why something like this should be explored. You have to give people some heads up on what is coming and what they can expect because it is coming. It's coming for everyone. And death shouldn't paint it, be painted as always being wrong. Death, dying is not evil. It's not the result of an evil. It's not wrong. It's sad and it's painful, but it doesn't automate that doesn't just because it's sad and painful doesn't make it wrong. You know, uh, children being killed by a car is probably, it, 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 you know, I guess the appro- the timing and the, I guess the quote unquote appropriateness of the death. I, I, you know, I would imagine an old person, you know, passing away in their sleep is a little more, appropriate than uh, you know some kid getting mown da- mowed down by a car because it chased the ball because the kid chased the ball into the street that that's more of a untimely and gruesome death as opposed to more of a peaceful death that you know who, one, one person who's just reached the end of their life and their body has just shut down on them you mentioned you you mentioned the natural order um, of course there are differences between you know you children should expect to bury their parents. Yes. Parents should never expect to bury their children. Correct. Uh, And then, taken to an extreme example, um, the, uh, what's his name, Marco Muzzo, the guy who did the drunk drive? Yeah, who killed the grandfather and the three kids, yeah. So, the parents of those children they will be in therapy for the rest of their life. You will never get over that. My, my. You will you will never you will never get over that. And there there are some things that you will never or should or you should never be expected to fully understand. That you yes. will never be expected to fully process. 
But those are extreme cases, right? We're talking more along the general lines of just explaining to children what death is. Yes. Because it's very hard to say, well, the person was here and now they're not. And one thing I've learned is you never equate death to go to sleeping. Never. No. Never. They did not go to sleep. They died. It's not the same thing. You never go because then you want then you're going to end up with a kid who doesn't want to go to sleep. You could you you could wind or up, doesn't want you to go to sleep because they're afraid you're not going to wake up. Again, the, from what you told me about Snuffleupagus, that mm-hmm. makes me question a lot of the things I've said to my own children, where I thought they were plain as day, but who knows how they are interpreting it, and who knows the lesson that they're taking away from something, right? Where you think you're doing the right thing by trying to teach them something. You don't know how they're internalizing it, right? Yeah, it's very difficult when you don't get when kids haven't gotten a thought process and haven't gotten to the age where they can ask a direct question. You know, there's that, there's that, there's that, there's that in between years where they they hear you and they're understanding you, but their cognitive process is still very, very it's still developing. So it's it's hard to get get some proper feedback on what they're what what they're hearing. And by and also by death education, which we should probably parse down a little bit more, um, we're not talking about any of the spiritual components that go along with that discussion. I don't think that that should be mandated um, because there are organizations out there who are operative in Canada right now, and they take a bunch of different tacks on it. You could have the traditional religious perspective on it. You can have some of the some of the new. Uh, some of the newer perspectives on it where they uh, try and look at it more as death as a, uh, well, they look on death as a part of life and they'll look even into alternative funeral arrangements. Um, One of our friends had, uh, I think they had her, uh, they had one of her parents put into, uh, uh, but uh, had ashes sprinkled around, uh, sprinkled around a tree. Okay. And it was, and it was, you know, a whole ceremony where this person is now, you know, they're part of nature again. Um, they went back to the earth. They're part of the part of the tree now. You know, there's some new life that comes out of it. So it's it's a whole spiritual thing that I don't think that should be part of the core curriculum. I guess if you wanna if you wanna call it that, um, when it comes to the education about death, uh, this is more practical issues, right? I don't know what takes place at the mortician's office. I don't know what happens to a body after it gets, or after after the after death takes place. Um, we had a discussion on crew roundtable about organ donation. Yes. Um, so I would encourage everyone to go and check that out. Uh, you can see all the past episodes crewroundtable.com. But those in between parts, where to me I still find it incredible that. Um, as you were saying, Jr., the, the the process is kind of sped up, uh, where things take place incredibly quick, and you are essentially at the mercy of funeral homes, morticians. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, they are telling you things that you might have absolutely zero exposure to, and you just end up saying, "Okay." Well, while they are trying to. Pull out, they're not that they're to, all not that they're all scam artists or anything like but that. But they are running a business. But it's a business, and, and upsell is there. It's you there. know, I'm not saying that they're going to deliver below below uh, you know a, a cut rate funeral and, and scam you. But you know, they are going to try to make money. Uh, they are in the in the business of making money. It's not a charity, and it's it, that is not the time to be making those kind of very big decisions. You know, a funeral prices have gotten ridiculous, really expensive. Uh, one, one can say almost, 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 almost uh, unreasonable. Uh, at a point, and, and 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 you're making it, and you're making those decisions at a point where you're really not, aren't capable of making them. So the the encouragement, the the, the decision of pre planning and discussing in advance, and not shying away from under. From facing the you know the impending mortality of your loved ones, is not is something you need to face uh, head on. It's something that used to be a reality every day. You know, loss of people used to, people dropped dead all the time. People were sad. 
but at the same time, people had to had to get up and keep moving. Otherwise, they, they themselves were going to die. And that's in the case of a sudden or unexpected death. Um, we're not even talking about the potential damage that someone can do to themselves just upon learning that their loved one is going into palliative care. Because when you go into palliative care, you don't come out. Yes. Right? And some people may not even may not even understand that. They say, well, they're in the hospital. They might be in, you know, certain advanced stages of palliative care. And they might think, well, maybe there's still hope. Yeah. Palliative care is essentially e- easing of pain That's all while it is. someone passes away. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's just comfort. It's just comfort a comfortable death for 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 the for the for the patients right and there's and there's no reason why someone should be exposed to the words palliative care the day before someone goes into palliative care because that is i think that's a disservice to that person who has no idea of what is about to take place they will be blindsided by what is going to happen because once you go in it could be it could take place quickly it could take place protracted over months but the only certainty is you you're not leaving true true right that's that's this that's the certainty um seeing as how we're both for the death education uh i wanted to uh, use this as our exit question then um when do you think that this should be instituted in schools because right now it's not I think it should be I think it should be part of the curriculum mm-hmm. uh, uh, when do you think it when do you think would be the right age to do it I, I, kids can experience loss at any age I, I think like uh, like the sex education it'd be, you sh- they should start it as soon as possible you know um, understanding what what it's like what things are like to die I mean you can't you shouldn't the, Delaying it does a disservice to children, and if you're delaying it because you're afraid to handle the hard topics with your kids because they're going to be upset and because they're going to be sad, because they're going to be crying, uh, it does a disservice to your children. You know, sometimes you need to be sad. It is a sad topic. You know, um, at what age? It's, it's hard to say because you know you can't wait until a kid's eight years old because that's that's a lot. That's a pretty long time that they won't to gamble that they're not going that a death is not going to happen uh, that you're going to need to deal with. So I, I don't know, I'm not I'm not I'm not a child psychologist. It's, it's a tough call, but I, I think you need to. I, I think that the, the notion of death should always should kind of always be around. You know, it shouldn't be something you don't talk about for the simple reason that you don't want to upset the child. You know, uh, I think it's just, it, 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 you know, uh, maybe there's a way to gradually increase it. Just like, um, just like the, the sex education kind of gradually brings it, brings uh, sex, sexual topics up for, 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 uh, for children. Um, and I think that, I think there might be a, uh, I think that might there might be a way for that as well to just kind of ease into it. For um, my opinion on this would be I'd I'd like to see it instituted officially somewhere around grade seven and eight because I think any younger than that, um, children will probably be more accepting to the brute fact. Um, again, not telling them someone went to sleep or whatever the case may be, just saying. You know, they passed on, they died, they were here, and now they're not here anymore. Um, I think any more of a nuanced explanation might be lost on someone younger than that. You hit grade 7, you hit grade 8, you're, uh, what, 12, 13 years old? No, right? I disagree. I th- I, 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 kids are more capable, uh, far younger than you realize. Um I mean, I, I, even myself, I think, I'm pretty sure I went to my first funeral well before, well before that. Oh, uh, okay, sorry. So, so okay, oh, sorry, maybe I, maybe I didn't phrase it correctly. Um, they're, they're certainly capable of understanding the big concept of someone's here and they're not anymore at a yeah. younger age, right? I, I'm speaking more to the point of the death education as we've gone through where we talk about the process, the palliative care, 
dying itself. Oh yeah, yeah. That's, maybe, maybe that's. I mean, that's you, where yeah, I that's came into seven, seven or is probably right there. Yes. But you, you need to, you need you can't just start everything there. That maybe that maybe that might be the apex of it. Yeah, like that's but where that's where I think the meat of it could come. You, you still need to start introducing the concept. You even even probably as as young as grade one. Yeah, for the for the concept, I think they can certainly. I, I I can think they can certainly understand it in a broad stroke. Young children can certainly get it. Um, but that's that's kind of the point I was trying to make where they won't have the capacity to kind of go into some of the further details, which would be answered later on when, you know, you've got the tools to understand what's happening and you can understand what's being told to you. As always, the first few uh, years are going to get kind of screwed over because they may have to deal with it, but they won't be given the... the uh, the um, education, but I mean, that's anytime you change education, there's always going to be a group that unfortunately gets missed. I mean, we went through a whole thing. I, I never learned how to spell <laughs> because they just, they just didn't teach that when I was going through school. Wow. Right. So it was just, you just assumed that you would learn it. With death, with death education, it, it's a little tricky because there's always going to be a certain number of kids who are going to react to it poorly, but that's not a reason why we shouldn't be doing it. And we all, we all know that what there's that one one friend of ours whose kid, you know, someone passed away and now the kid thinks every time that the parents leave the room, they're never going to see them again. And, they, and, and so they have to be with them 24-7 because they don't, because they, they, they're, the kid now gets goes on the assumption that they're going to leave the house one day and they're never going to come back. And, but, you know, for every one kid like that, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe the, especially for a kid like that, they need to have, uh, need to be educated on death. You know, uh, and the takeaway is to, you know, enjoy, when, you know, have fun with your parents now. It's not a matter of not, you know, being afraid that they're going to be, they're going to be gone, but not, not the waste of time you have. I agree you with know. you. Uh, people don't, don't deal with death as they should. They don't deal with, um, I find that a lot of people, especially, you know, we live in a very affluent part of the world. A lot of people maybe don't deal with want. As much as they, as much as they should. Well, death is a rarity for us, in, and in, it's in, a the West, in the Western world, it's it's relatively rare. Before we go, uh, if you want to give the name of that author once again, because you seemed very keen on that book. Okay, yeah. Once again, uh, let me pull it up here. Uh, her name is uh, Caitlin Doty. Uh, let me spell that out for you: C A I T L I N, and her last name is D O U G H T Y. I believe she, you can reach her at CaitlinDoty.com. We'll put that in the show notes. And uh, her web series is called Ask, Ask a Mortician. Uh, and uh, the book is called Smoke Gets in Your Eyes. Le- other Lessons from the... Uh, is it, uh, Smoke Gets in Your Eyes and Other Lessons from the Crematory. Now, I won't lie to you. Uh, when I go through and do the show notes um, they're probably going to be done in bulk for our first few episodes I may forget to put in that web okay. note. So, so listen up uh, so that's the first uh, official endorsement on Crew Roundtable Bites I encourage everyone to head over to the website crewroundtable.com where you can subscribe get this get all the other shows in our feed and subscribe or and also follow us uh, on Twitter at Crew Roundtable uh, which is manned by the one and only JR, highly entertaining. Uh, you won't be sorry that you did. Thanks very much. Take care, everyone. See you guys.